Welcome to the IFRS Foundation's monthly podcast. In this final episode of 2019, we'll look at the key discussions and decisions taken during the latest meeting of the International Accounting Standards Board on the 11th and 12th of December, as well as some other interesting developments. My name is Claire Short, and I am part of the communications team here at the IFRS Foundation. Today, I'm joined by Chair of the Board, Hans Hugervorst, and Vice Chair, Sue Lloyd. We'll touch on IFRS 17, IBOR reform, business combinations under common control, and IFRS for SMEs. But before we dive right into these topics, it's worth noting that we've just published an important exposure draft as part of our primary financial statements project. Hans, can you tell us a bit more about this? Yes, um, we are uh, very happy to uh, finally uh, publish our exposure draft on some very important uh, proposals, which are all about giving investors better insight in the performance of a company. And what we basically do is provide much more structure to the income statement. That's the major part of the uh, proposals. We are defining a couple of subtotals, which are now absent in uh, IFRS. Uh, The main one being operating profit. Almost every company uses operating profit, but they all do so in uh, different ways. So we'll increase comparability there. We will also increase the transparency and discipline around the use of non-GAAP. So what we call management performance measures, performance measures as defined by management itself instead of by us. They will have to provide them in one single note, uh, provide reconciliation to the nearest IFRS uh, subtotal. And all this will lead to much more transparency and uh, discipline. And then finally, we have a couple of proposals that will improve the uh, grouping of information in the financial uh, uh, statements, in the income statement. There are now too many elements of income that are aggregated together. So improve this aggregation. Uh, We have uh, provided guidance as to what elements of income or expense companies should call unusual or not. And uh, we believe that that is very important information for investors to get an impression of how persistent the earnings of a company can be. Thank you, Hans. And anyone interested in finding out more about this exposure draft can visit our website at ifres.org. Moving on to December's board meeting, let's take a glance at a project that has a lot of interested stakeholders, the proposed amendments to IFRS 17. Sue, what came out of your latest discussions? In November, some of you might remember, we were presented with a summary of the feedback that we've got through the comment letters on the exposure draft. And so in December, we've moved on to finalising some of the proposed amendments, especially those that received a lot of support from the people responding to our consultation. So we spent most of our time uh, talking about two topics. One was the proposals on further deferral of acquisition costs, which we agreed to extend with some clarifications. And then perhaps the most substantive discussion was around the proposals to do with accounting for reinsurance contracts, where people liked what we proposed, but many suggested the scope was a bit too narrow. So we discussed that and and really decided to extend the scope of our original proposal. And we'll continue the uh, remaining deliberations when we get back in 2020. I think the plan is really to wrap up the re-deliberations over January and February, if we can. That sounds good, see? And for listeners with an appetite for more information on the insurance contracts accounting, there's a dedicated IFRS 17 podcast that digs deeper into the details of the board discussion at the December meeting. The latest episode of this podcast is available online, on our YouTube channel, and on your podcast player. Another topic gleaning a lot of interest from the industry is that of financial instruments. We have updates on two projects relevant to this talking point, IBOR and financial instruments with characteristics of equity, or more succinctly known as FICE. Sue, can you expand on the developments around these two projects? Sure. So firstly, on IBOR, so we're now focusing on the second phase of this project, so looking at the accounting implications once rates and contracts are actually replaced, so what happens then? Um, We started talking about that in October when we talked about classification and measurement and this month we've moved on to considering the potential hedge accounting issues that arise as a result of interest rate benchmark reform. And we tentatively decided to propose a few amendments to both IFRS 9 and IAS 39. Basically we're going to propose to make some amendments which would enable a company applying hedge accounting to continue its hedge accounting uninterrupted 
as long as the only changes occurring are really as a direct result of updating for the change in IBOR. Now anyone listening who understands hedge accounting will know that there's lots more detail behind all of that, but that's the general idea. So we plan to continue these discussions in the new year and aim to publish an exposure draft as soon as we can in 2020. Um, moving on to uh, Financial Instruments with Characteristics of Equity, or FICE. So we looked at the project plan for the re-deliberations earlier this quarter, and at this month's board meeting we started the more specific discussions on this topic, looking at the very geeky technical area of how you classify a financial instrument, where it will or may be settled by the issuer delivering its own equity instruments, both derivative and non-derivative instruments. So the staff had some original ideas for us to look at, and really they were looking for a steer from us on whether we liked the direction of what they are proposing. So we gave them some feedback on some clarifications that we hope could be useful to try to come up with an underlying principle for the so-called fixed for fixed condition in IAS 32. So we want to come up with a principle that would really explain the conditions that would be necessary for a contract that will be settled in a company's own shares to be classified as equity. So basically, what's special about those contracts that mean they would get equity classification? And the idea would be that if we can come up with that principle, then when you look at the requirements in IAS 32, you could sort of frame your decision making around that. So we like the initial ideas and we've sent the staff away to think in some more detail. Progress is being made on a number of other important projects. Hans, can you update us on the business combinations under common control project? The board has already discussed the predecessor approach and how it should be applied at a meeting earlier this quarter, but what happened at the December session? Yes, yeah, so in this project we are discussing two different approaches to accounting for business combinations where one business controls both the businesses that are being uh, combined. And we've been, uh, in the past months, we've been looking at the question under what circumstances to use the cost-based predecessor method and in what circumstances to use the current value acquisition uh, accounting. This month, we have turned uh, our uh, attention to the question that if the circumstances are such that you would have to use the current value approach, how to do so? And we decided that the receiving company in the business combination should apply the current value approach in IFRS as it is. That is the approach used for what we call the normal acquisition. However, and that's a difference with uh, IFRS 3, if there is a bargain purchase, the uh, receiving company should recognize the contribution as an increase in equity rather than a gain in profit or loss. Having said that, uh, bargain purchases are uh, very rare, uh, so we don't expect this to uh, happen a lot. Going forward into 2020, we will return to discuss the predecessor approach and how it should be applied, as well as uh, looking at uh, disclosure requirements. Thank you. Sue, so back to you. Um, we've already covered some of the biggest projects underway, but there are important points to note regarding implementation and maintenance matters. Sure. And at the December meeting, we were really looking at sort of finalising the deliberations and getting confirmation that we can move on to drafting. And we discussed two projects in the implementation space. One was um, some narrow scope amendments that we're making to IES 37 to do with identifying onerous contracts. And secondly, the annual pro um, improvements that we proposed earlier in the year. And basically annual improvements are small changes to either clarify the words in a standard or to correct relatively sort of minor unintended consequences or oversights or conflicts between standards. So in this package of annual improvements we're looking at tweaks to IFRS 1 for first time adopters, IFRS 9 and uh, illustrative examples in the leasing standard and in IES 41. And basically the board confirmed that uh, we can move, afford, uh, move forward to publication. So we'll publish these final amendments in the second quarter of next year. And the effective date will be for annual financial statements beginning from January 2022. It looks as though the first half of 2020 is set to be a busy one for the board and for stakeholders with several important consultations coming out. One such project is the comprehensive review of the IFRS for SME standard, with a consultation document due to be published very early in the new year. Hans, can you fill us in on progress there? 
Yes, Claire, as part of the review of the uh, SME standard as it is, the board has developed a request for information. We call that an RFI, and that will be uh, published at the end of January 2020. It's essentially an RFI is essentially an invite to people with an interest in this standard to share their views with us on some big questions. Uh, we will be asking questions that will help shape the future of the SME standard uh, and about whether and how the SME star standard should be updated for and aligned with a number of new I4S standards and amendments that have been issued to existing standards since the last update to the SME standard. In December, the only decision that we needed to take uh, before the consultation document goes out early next year was to agree on the comment period, and we decided that will be six months. Thanks, Hans. And on the topic of SMEs, the board is also currently looking at subsidiaries that are SMEs. What are the developments there? Yeah, <clears throat> this is a really a completely different standard, although it also carries the uh, abbreviation SME. Very different project. This project is one where we are looking into whether subsidiaries that have a parent applying full IFRS standards in its consolidated financial statements, if such subsidiaries can apply the recognition and measurement requirements in full IFRS, but with the reduced uh, disclosure requirements of the SME standard. And those disclosure requirements need a little adjustment to reflect differences in recognition and measurement requirements, and our staff are looking at these uh, adjustments. Uh, this time we received a very interesting presentation by Chris Peach, who is the chair of the Australian Accounting Standards Board, AASB, in which he talked about a very uh, similar projects that they have been consulting on in Australia. The comment period on their proposals ended on the 30th of November, November, so it was useful for us to hear about the stakeholders' feedback that the AASB received um, so that we can uh, take this into account before making any decisions on whether to move our subsidiaries that are SMEs project to a standard-setting project. It's good that we at the ISB can learn from the work done by national standard setters in their home jurisdiction, and this was a very good example of that. Um, before we wrap up the final podcast of 2019, um, Sue, can you shed some light on the proposed an amendments to IAS 8? Sure. This, so this is our project on accounting policies and accounting estimates, and it's about um, providing some uh, more guidance to help companies distinguish between a change in accounting policy and a change in accounting estimate. The board's already decided to finalise the amendments, and, um, and so now we're moving on to the sort of finalisation package so the amendments will introduce a definition of accounting estimates in IES 8 that will help companies to really distinguish these from changes in accounting policy. And this month we decided that when these new changes come in, we'll get companies to apply the amendments going forward, so not retrospectively, and that they'll be effective from January 2022 again. So the technical staff have been given the green light to go ahead and draft the final amendments, so again we can issue these in the first half of 2020. Thank you. And thank you both for being part of the 2019 podcast series. Before we sign off for the year, I thought I'd ask for both of you to mention one of your highlights from, from the past 12 months. Sue? This, this is like being on desert island discs, but not as much fun. <laughs> okay, I'll choose a suite if that's all right, if that's yeah. not breaking the rules. I think we've done some good work this year supporting people applying our standards through the Interpretations Committee, but also being proactive with suggesting some amendments to IFRS 17 to help people with implementation, and also importantly um, responding to phase one of IBOR on a timely basis. So I hope, you know, showing people that we can step up and help out when it's needed. I think those are definitely causes to celebrate. And yours, Hans, <laughs> your highlights? Well, I think the um, project that I started out with, the Primary Financial Statements Project, is really a big improvement uh, to accounting. So I think that will hopefully turn out to be a, a highlight. And otherwise, you know, looking back on the last year, I uh, did a lot of traveling again to our uh, stakeholders around the world. And that's something I always enjoy, uh, to go to uh, Latin America, to Asia, uh, most recently to China, which has made uh, tremendous progress. And it's always very inspiring to meet with the local people and to see how they are dealing with uh, our requirements. Uh, and I always uh, return a bit inspired by that. It's a, it's a worthwhile mission. And that brings to a close our final IASB update podcast of 2019. 
Thank you for listening to us. And if you have any feedback, please email communications at ifrs.org. The full summary of December's board meeting, including all discussions and decisions, can be found at the IASB update at ifrs.org. On behalf of the Foundation and the board, we wish you all a safe, festive season and a prosperous new year. Until next time, goodbye.